we have been working through the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke, and we are in chapter 16 this week, starting in verse 1, going through verse 17, and I invite you to turn along, grab a Bible, turn along with us. If not, it'll also be, the scripture will also be up on the screen for you to follow along. Um, yeah, it's a fun one. It's a fun one if you've read ahead already, but let's dig in, let's, uh, let's read, and we'll talk about it. All right, so here we go. He, that is Jesus, also said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. So he called to him and he said to him, what is this I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be a manager. The manager said to himself, what shall I do since my master is taking away the management from me? I'm not strong enough to dig and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So, summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, and how much do you owe my master? He said, a hundred measures of oil. And he said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. And then he said to another, how much do you owe? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and write 80. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. Okay, let's stop there for a second. What in the world is going on here? Across scholarship, across commentators, across kind of all of Christianity throughout history, this, this parable right here has been identified as probably the hardest parable to really understand what in the world is going on and to interpret. So here's my disclaimer for today. Uh, there's a lot to unpack here. I'm going to try to to not go down that road because it can lead into a lot of uh, rabbit trails. I'm going to try to keep it simple for us today. Um, it may be the fullness of the, the thing. It may not. If you know what this is supposed to mean, write a book so the rest of us can read it <laughs> so that we all know what exactly it means. But uh, I'm going to kind of maybe key in on a couple small things that are being said here that I think, that I hope... Um, exemplify a lot of what Jesus is trying to say. And I think that last sentence right there, where the, the, the manager commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. He's saying, man, you are so good at being dishonest, right? You're dishonest, you're fired, but man, are you so darn good at it. What would happen if you were honest? What would happen if you took the same shrewdness, the same cleverness, and instead of using it for a selfish and dishonest ambition, you used it for good. Huh. Because then Jesus goes on to say, he says, turn me back on my page four, the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. He's talking to the disciples here. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you with the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money." Some very blunt statements and, and truth from here from Jesus. And by the way, oh, oh, guess who else is listening here? The Pharisees. So these would have been the religious leaders of the time. Most of Israel would have seen them and said, these are the people that, that follow God well. They are super religious. They follow every single law down to the detail, down to the smallest, tiniest dot, right? They trim their mint plants and tithe 10%. That's how absolutely devoted they are to God. But... As we read here, the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, and they got defensive, and they ridiculed him, that is Jesus, and he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were until John and then the good news of the kingdom is preached, but everyone forces his way into it. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. All right, that's a little bit confusing in and of itself, so let's address this, and then let's go back into the middle. Jesus is confronting the Pharisees because the Pharisees were rich. They had beautiful, ornate clothing. They traveled in 
uh, great processions there. The, the places where they worshiped were richly and beautifully decorated because all, all the money that they would use to, to do all these things and to, to, to uh, enhance their own lifestyles, right? Under the auspicion that, hey, I am serving God. This money is being used towards God's purposes. But God saw into their heart and is saying, no, you love to be exalted by men because you are rich, all of the entire Old Testament, all of the law, all of the prophets, everything God says in the, in the Old Testament and that is now being fulfilled in the New Testament is saying, God desires you to be merciful, to be gracious, to take what you have and to care for the poor, for the widowed, for the orphaned, for the oppressed. Everything about God's whole narrative, the entire story of Israel coming up through until the New Testament is God saying, I care for the people who are going through a hard time. And so if you, if I've blessed you, if you've been blessed with an abundance of wealth and abundance of resources, it is me and it is your responsibility and your way of following me to take care of these people. And these Pharisees didn't do that. There's another place in the Bible where Jesus rebukes the Pharisees because Instead of using their money to take care of their old widowed grandmothers, they would tithe it to the church as an excuse of, oh, this money needs to go towards God. Well, this money paid their salaries, right? And so instead of taking care, instead of taking care of their grandparents, right, they said, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm serving God. I'm being pious by using this money for the church, but in really I'm just using this money for myself and skirting the very thing that God, every single one of God's laws are requiring them to do, which is to be merciful, to be gracious, to take care of those who take care of themselves. All right, so Jesus is telling this parable about, to the disciples about, man, man, this world is so good at being dishonest. What if we all worked towards being honest? And then he does a little bit of a, this, this misdirection here, and he points to the people that everyone else would have said, you're the ones who are doing it correctly, and he says, you're the ones who are doing it the worst. Because you love money, and you're serving money over and against serving God, and, it's, and, it, and God knows your hearts, whereas everyone else is exalting you for it. All right, so... There's a story a little, what was this, five years ago, there was a um, a guy named Marcus Hutchins, he was 23 at the time, and uh, as he was growing up as a teenager, he found out, realized that he was very good at programming, and uh, so he um, was looking for ways to kind of use it, to have fun, and he started to receive affirmation and, and some praise as he started to program malware. Now, if you're not necessarily computer literate, malware is the thing that comes in and it makes your computer not do what you want it to do, right? It does bad things to your computer. And he started to, started to uh, socialize on these chat rooms and, and forums where uh, everyone was doing malware and posting their malware as, as a means of boasting. They really didn't care, weren't being necessarily nefarious with it, but just kind of a say, way of saying, hey, look what I could do. And everybody else was like, wow, dude, you're really good at this. And he started to get in deeper and deeper because that's what the cycle of kind of affirmation does is it starts to spiral you down where you're getting love and affirmation from. And so he got involved into writing malware, into writing programs that eventually um, got so complex they could hack bank accounts. It's a really big deal and something that wasn't possible, right? We all have this two-factor identification on bank accounts. And he he wrote a program that could bypass that groundbreaking breakthrough this was this was this was a type of of hacking of malware that had not been really realized until that part that point in time finally once he got there he got into and had an encounter where he realized oh this isn't just me writing programs for fun to show off what i can do i'm i'm hurting people real lives are being affected because i'm using my skills in the wrong way and and he backed off he backed off from what he was doing in there and he got burned. All the people that were enabling him, he, fe- he, he then found out weren't, weren't really cheering for him. They were manipulating him. They were using him for their own good. They were being dishonest in the same way that he was being dishonest. And so he got burned badly by the community that had once declared their love for him. But he turned a corner. To his credit, right, he turned a corner and he started writing a blog. He started utilizing his insider knowledge of how malware worked to analyze how all the different 
programs and malwares and Trojan horses and worms and, and, and different things that were being used um, around the world, the different things that would come through. And he would analyze them and break them apart. And, and eventually he got hired by a cybersecurity company because he was like, wow, dude, you're really good at this. He was. And there was this, I think this was in like 2018, 2019, there was this particularly effective malware called WannaCry. And he helped stop it. Within a day, it had infected over 300,000 computers. It had taken down governments and banks and public sectors and utilities, and he found an exploit in it, and he published it, and he made it known, and they were able to stop it and to get back all of the money and all of the things that had been um, robbed because of this. However, that was a great deed that also alerted the FBI to, hey, this guy's really good at this. How did he know this? And they looked into his background and figured out, oh, he was also the guy that wrote the bank account hacking software. So they arrested him, as they should. And when they did, a whole community of cyber professionals called for his release because he had done so much good with his skills. And so we went before a judge. A judge heard his story, heard everything, and he faced up to five years in jail and $250,000 in fine. But the judge, recognizing that he had turned a corner on his own, willingly, that though he had been unfaithful in the past with the big things he had turned, and he decided, I want to be faithful and do good with the things that I have, sentenced him to time served and one year of probation. A dramatic turnaround and a pretty good illustration of what Jesus is saying here of, man, you were so good at being honest. What would happen if you were honest and tried to do good and tried to serve faithfully with what you have? Well, this is the type of thing that would happen. Jesus calls us to serve faithfully, to faithfully serve God with what he's given us. And God's given us a lot. Right? Not only has God given us, made us, not only has he given us our talents, our abilities, he's given us all of creation. In verses 11 and 12, Jesus says this, it's kind of a little bit cryptic, but he says, if, if you have not been faithful in unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you with the true riches? And in another way of saying this, if you have not been faithful with that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? So that's a bit interesting, but let's take a second, let's think about this. God made us stewards of all of creation. That happened all the way back at the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter 2. He declared us as humans. He put us in charge of creation to steward it for the good and the glory of God, to, to use our skills and our abilities and to use creation itself to help it thrive, to help it flourish. The earth, the sea, the air, and the space are all God's. He's just allowing us to use them all. So, by continuation of that, by the, uh, going down to that source of, source of logic, nothing that we own, right? Because we own land, a house, a building, a car, possessions, clothes, whatever it might be. None of it's ours. Not even the paper money that it's printed on. The paper that money's printed on is ours. It's all God's. God created it. God is the one who owns it. He gave it to us. He has us being stewards of it, but it's all his just like in this parable. We are stewards of creation. God has called us, has sent us to be the stewards of creation, to steward it well. Now, what's happened? We haven't. Sin entered the picture. And so in many ways, like the dishonest manager, we have used God's good creation for our own benefit. To try to make our lives comfortable, to try to give us a, uh, whatever it is that we might be desiring, power, influence, respect, comfort, on and on and on. But God tells us this in verse 10. One who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much, but one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. And he's telling that to his disciples. He's telling them, and that message comes to us as well. It might feel like we have very little to offer God, very little to put forth in the way of, of taking care of people who are not doing well, people who are poor, sick, orphans, widowed, oppressed, whatever it might be. But God calls us to be faithful in whatever we have, whether it's a very, very little or very, very much to use what we have towards his good. And let's put this into perspective for just a moment. So the median American makes $63,000 a year. 
right? Not average, because the average gets skewed, gets skewed by the billionaires, the median. So the person right smack dab in the middle of, of America earns $63,000 a year. And that puts the median American, the average American, within the 0.2% wealthiest people in the world. Which was shocking to me when I read that. I don't think of myself as wealthy. I earn, you guys know my salary, I earn $63,000 a year. I don't think of myself as wealthy. It's kind of comfortable, right? It, but it doesn't necessarily, I would look at the millionaires and the billionaires like, man, that's wealthy. But no, <laughs> by statistically, me, most of us, in fact, everyone who, who makes more than $2,000 a year, because that's over 90% of the world only makes that much, would be classified as exceedingly wealthy. Another way to put this in perspective, the houses that we live in are far more luxurious than any of the palaces in history. Think of the greatest kings, the greatest emperors, the greatest queens and, and rulers that ever lived before the year 1900, and our houses that we live in are a whole lot nicer than the palaces that they did. We've got air conditioning and heating. We can decide exactly what degree we want our houses to be. We have running water. We have sewage. We have electricity, something they could never even comprehend. Perhaps what would be the most fascinating thing to them is when you open up your cupboard in the kitchen and you see that rack of spices that cost about $15. That would be an absolute fortune to anyone in history. That would make us the richest people in history just by owning these $15 of spices. It's amazing. Not to mention, right, our stove and our oven, our dishwashers and, and, and our, our clothes washers and clothes dryers. It goes on and on. We could continue to go um, through all of the different luxuries that are just taken for granted. They're standard in a house nowadays, but they are so much greater and more luxurious than anyone in history has experienced. Here's my point. It might feel like we have very little. It might feel like we don't have much wealth or much possessions to be able to contribute, but we do. The reason why we don't is because everyone around us is just as wealthy as us. And few are even far more obscenely wealthy than us. And the next point behind that, the point that we originally made, is that none of this is ours. We don't own any of it. We are stewards of it from the very beginning. And God calls all of us to use this to love people in the way that he loved us. So what are we doing with what we have, right? How are we using God's wealth to serve God? Back in the year uh, 258 AD, so back at the, the kind of the height of Rome's power, uh, the, the, the Christian church was just starting to take off. They were struggling, and the emperor Valerian um, wanted to, execute and kill all of the bishops, priests, deacons, and elders in Rome. So he did. He went and he took Pope, ben, the, Pope Sixtus II and beheaded him. And, about, and right when that happened, the, the head deacon of, of the church at that time, his name was Lawrence, um, the English version of Lawrence, he was probably more like Florencio or something like that, something in Latin. Uh, he saw this happen and he was like, I'm next, Right? They're going to come for me. And in fact, they did. The emperor came and the, and the prefect, the head of the Roman religion at the time, uh, told Lawrence to turn over all of the treasures of the church. Everything, because they, they assumed that Christians must be obscenely wealthy. And so Lawrence walked in. At least this is the legend. The, how the legend goes, Lawrence walked in to go you know, face the prefect. And then the prefect said, okay, where's all the treasures? He had the doors open and in came the sick, the poor, the orphans widows and the oppressed and Lawrence said here here are the treasures of the church and then he was killed if then you have not been faithful with the unrighteous wealth who will entrust you to the true riches another way of saying unrighteous wealth so wealth that um, or, or worldly wealth wealth that is what we may possess here, but won't we possess for eternity? Who will give you the true riches? What are the true riches? What are those things that, that would be better than having amazing possessions or, or having the best experiences and the best vacations and the best vacation homes and everything like that? Well, the true riches of God are these. 
a joy that is steadfast throughout the toughest of times, a love that endures all things, a hope that knows no bounds, a peace that surpasses all understanding, a faith that can move mountains. And as Jesus talks about here, make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous wealth so that when it fails, they may receive you into eternal dwellings the relationships that we have with the people around us. So many ways, I, I ask you, and I don't have the answer for this, but I ask you to reflect on yourself. What, what am I working for? What am I using my money for? Now, there's our basic needs, right? Health, safety, and shelter, food, those type of things. But what is, my, what is my ambitions driving me towards? What if I would earn more, if I'm trying to earn more, if I'm trying to acquire something, what is the purpose behind that? What am I hoping to achieve? I think so often, and at least this is, this is true for me and perhaps it's true for you, what I'm working toward truly is to be loved, to be in relationship with the people around me and to be loved by them. What Jesus offers, what God offers, God offers a love that is perfect and a community that is throughout all time. And so he calls us, he calls us, he called the Pharisees, he calls his disciples, he says, that which you have right now, be faithful with what it is, use it towards the good of the kingdom of God and I will give you the true riches, the things that money cannot buy the things that only God can give, the thing that only the Holy Spirit possesses. Because God gave us creation, and he calls us to faithfully serve him with everything he's given us, but he's given us so much more than that. God, not only has he given us creation, he's given us himself. When Jesus came down into the world, Jesus, God, the infinite God, the God who made the entire universe, became a human restricted himself to a human body. It's beyond fathomable, but he did it. And he did it so that he would then restore relationship with humans because we rebelled against him. But Jesus went, he died on the cross so that all of the things that we have done against God, all the ways in which we've rebelled and sabotaged our relationship against God, the ways we have sinned, he took that upon himself. He took the penalty for that. Upon himself. He took the debt that we owed upon himself and he paid it. And not only did Jesus die, not only did he die for us, but then he also came back to life for us. So that, so that we could live. And not just live in the sense of go to heaven, live, but to live right now, to have eternal life right now, to have the Holy Spirit, God himself, working and living inside of us so that as we struggle with this world of sin and the pain and the sickness and the death and the shame that comes with it, that he will be working in our hearts so that we can love each other. We can know what it means to be loved. And then when Jesus comes again so that we can celebrate together in heaven for eternity, working, playing, loving, doing whatever it is that heaven's going to exactly look like, and that's a fun conversation in and of itself, but we can do it without the pain of sin. We can do it in God's presence, and we can do it together. Amen. We get a taste of that. We get a taste of what heaven is going to be like when we come and we eat together at the table. Jesus, when he instituted the Lord's Supper, he, he took the bread and he said, actually he said before, even that, he said, whoever eats of my flesh, right, will know an, an eternal um, filling that food cannot bring. Whoever drinks of my blood will know a salvation and a life that is not otherwise known from food and drink here on this earth. And so when we come and we eat at this table, the Holy Spirit is working in this bread, in this grape juice, in this wine, whatever it might be, so that we, we are eating at the table of God, so that everyone who has lived before us, everyone who has lived after us, everyone who is going to eat at the table of God in heaven is eating with us when we come here. And so I invite you, I invite you to come and to eat.
come and to drink together with the people who are not just here, but through the mystery and the power of the Holy Spirit with Jesus Christ himself and with the saints from all generations. Jesus took the bread and after giving thanks, he broke it saying, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after they had supped, he took the cup and he poured it out and he said, this is my blood poured out for you as a New Testament. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me.